It is member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. And we had a uh, really special guest who was on with us this week, Dion Warwick, doing the Blue Note through Sunday. And what a wonderful person. She said, you know what, come back and we'll do an- another little chat after the, uh, the first one on the phone. And that's what we have right here, a very special thing on our Friday that we have together. Thank you so much, Dion, for being our guest. My pleasure. Thank you for having me again. It is a huge thrill, and you're so welcome. You know, I was watching the whole family affair, the way you describe it up there on stage. And it is incredible for folks who come to the show. You'll see she has a whole bunch of family members who are going to be performing with her. And obviously her son, Damon, has also produced her record. But it made me think of when I when I watched it. I mean, first you said it was going to be that way, but then it really was different ages of people were young and people who are your, your granddaughter. And, and so a couple of grandchildren. Is that partially influenced by the fact that when you were young, you had a very similar familial exposure to music through your own family? Absolutely, and it's wonderful to know that um, my grandbabies are as interested in in music, period. Not necessarily performing, but uh, the music end of it. I think music is a vital part of everybody's life. And it's good for the soul. And do you see yourself, though, as playing the role of why they're so... I mean, listen to them sing. They just unload like cannons up there. Uh, yeah, they do. Like I said, they, they, Cheyenne especially has grown into her voice. And Leland will be growing into hers. Um, it's just... Um, oh, the old saying, the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. Right. And it's just a great tribute to the way when you were young, the same sort of stuff happened to you. And even like you told that great story of being backstage at the Apollo when they came looking for for a singer. I mean, and that was a family thing there, too. Sure was. It was during a gospel uh, caravan and my mom, my mother's group, the gos- the I don't want to say gospel as it was my group, <laughs> the Drinkard Singers, which were my aunts and uncles, her siblings. And um it was, uh, like I said, you know, all I knew was music, and uh, it's, it's a part of me. It's a huge part of me, and it's a part of a lot of the people listening to hear your voice talking to us. We, we were uh, on your phone interview that we played the other day on the air, stunning new What the World Needs Now is on She's Back, and I use that as like the music at the end of our interview, and it, it gave me chills because there's so many voices. Tell us a little bit about the re-recording of that, because there must have been, there's a lot of folks singing on that. It sure is. It's a choir, an incredible choir out of Newark, New Jersey, called Jubilation. And it was a thrill recording with them. I loved that choir very, very much. And they apparently loved me because they all volunteered to be a part of the recording. And uh, it's, it's time to hear something of that nature again. You know, we need love. We definitely need love. This world is going in such a chaotic way that the only thing that can bring it back, I think, is love. Was that partially, and when I was hearing and I was like, wow, I wonder if she chose this because of the nature of how things have devolved in the world. Absolutely. You know, I think it's something people need to hear again and pay attention to now. Um, and I'm certain that they're feeling what's going on in the world right now. So maybe th- this time around, what the world needs now is love, sweet love will re- resonate it's such a great message you still remember the first time that you heard that one i mean that's like one of those ones that's like you've had this epic connection to so many songs you have oh yeah i heard that when I, in fact i didn't want to record that song at all uh the song was written for it had a cowboy lilt to it when uh, it was written it was written for gene pitney i believe and um it just was not my didn't feel like me it didn't sound like me and I turned it down, and uh, because of an obligation to Liberty Records, uh, Burton Howe chose to do the song with Jackie DeShannon, uh, who's a little cowgirl anyway. <laughs> but uh, what they did was they used my formula, the formula that they used to record me, which is what you're hearing now today. Wow, that is so cool. That's a great history. And again, that's one of the neat things when you, I was thinking on another question that came to mind when I was watching you play, not a lot of artists have a catalog like yours. Sometimes people want to have songs that are new that they want to present or that, you know, there may be very unfamiliar moments to the audience. But you, with the exception of, of playing something that was on that great record of, I guess, Cheyenne's record, that, that song, you just have so many songs that you could choose from that span decades and decades. I mean, people were born and lived their lives 
sets during this period. How do you go about choosing what you're going to do when you do one of these sets? That can be difficult at times. It really can. But I, I chose songs that I know people expect mm -hmm. to hear. And every now and then I'll throw in something that they, oh, I remember that. Yes, but wow, mm, I like that one too. You know, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to me too, so that, because I get a chance to sing some of the songs that I haven't sung in ages as well. You have played a lot of very special engagements in your career with these songs. You've taken these songs all over the world. So many people around the world connect with your music. And when I was thinking of how remarkable it was that you were doing a return engagement at the Blue Note Hawaii, which is its own special little venue here and part of a, a special chain of venues, it made me think back to your career and some of the really, I mean, unbelievable stuff you've done like five week run of dates in paris at the olympia that turns into a classic record what are what are recollections from being a young lady at the top of the game playing that place i mean what kind of demand you must have had to do five weeks there it was wonderful i mean i was young and foolish like everybody else who was there <laughs> performing uh, and to have been uh, playing the olympia theater which is one of the grand dames of theaters worldwide. Uh, it was a joy, and it was very easy to do. There, uh, yeah, I love how you put that because I was I, I had a feeling that over your kind of career, stepping on some of these special stages, that some of them would feel a little closer to you than others. So you call that a remarkable or, or a special one. You talked about playing with Bob Marley at Madison Square Garden the other day on the air. What are some other stages that maybe don't come up so much in interviews that you think back to that you can you can flash to that you, that you stick in your mind and that maybe venues that are so unusual where you think, wow, I don't believe I'm here. Oh, wow. It's the Palladium in London, the Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, most of the concert halls around the world, I mean, I have been truly blessed, in fact, uh, to have been invited to sing in these halls. There are halls in Germany that nobody probably ever heard of that are the elite halls to sing in. And um, they're just too many to even think about naming. <laughs> White House experiences. I know there's some White House experiences yeah. through the years. Any that come to mind that stick out and make you think, wow, here I, here I was at that. Well, it's, you know, there are many presidents that I had the pleasure <laughs> of singing before and, you know, too many to mention. All the way back to Nixon. Uh, no. Nixon? No. But it wasn't, I saw, thought I saw a picture of you with... Uh, Nixon, you saw me with Reagan, you saw me with uh, Johnson. Wow. You saw me with, um, oh my goodness. Uh, you ever sing for Obama? Yes, I have. In fact, he sang to me. Oh, that's pretty special. It sure is. In fact, you can see it and hear it on YouTube. And when we think about Obama, he is uh, born here in Honolulu, and another guy who's really big here in Honolulu is had big all over the world, of course, Elvis Presley. I have to get you to tell, one a couple years ago when you were on, you told the fantastic story, and when you told it, the thing that really I'll never forget is you said this was the most exciting experience that ever happened in your life. Yeah, you know, um, I was performing in Vegas at the same time that Elvis was performing, he was at the Hilton, which was known at Hilton at the time, and that's the San Ho Sands Hotel. And Jack and Trotter, who ran the Sands Hotel, happened to be going to his opening night. And I told him I wanted to go. He said, you can't go because you have a show to do. I said, I want to go. And he always treated me like I was his daughter, so I just went into daughter land on him. <laughs> and he, he, he relented. He, he darkened the room that night, and, and went to, I went to the show with him. And um, after the show, well, let me back up a minute and let you know the relationship. Um, the Sweet Inspirations, who are my family, happened to be part of the backing group on stage with him. And uh, I had gone to his rehearsal and I said hello to him and he was very nice to me. And uh, after the show was over, we went backstage to say hello again. And he did something that was so... I. I, I'll never forget it. He decided to put a photograph of himself inside of every single album that was on any in any music store in Vegas of himself in my albums. And he made the announcement from the stage: "You buy Dionne Warwick 
album, you get a photograph of Elvis Presley. I don't think I sold more. I sold more albums <laughs> ever in Las Vegas at that time. It was one of the most magnanimous things I could think of happening to me. Right. What a generous thing to do. And and did you ever get a chance to, to thank him? I mean, Elvis oh, yeah. Presley does this for you. What did you tell him? I sure did. You know, fortunately, uh, we became friends. You know, yeah. we lived in the same area in Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, uh, he asked me who my throat doctor was, and I told him. And he said, well, I need to find a doctor for Lisa Marie. I said, what's wrong with her? She has to have her tonsils out. I said, oh, I, my kids had just had their tonsils out. I said, oh, Dr. Edward Cantor. He's the only doctor that could ever do a job like that. And he's brilliant with children. And from that day to this, you know, if he was still alive, we'd still be saying, hey, how you doing? Wow, what a personal connection. It had all developed from that experience when the sweet inspirations had been backing him. Mm -hmm, exactly. And you had never really gotten to interact with him prior to that gig in Vegas, even though they, your family was working. Had they just started that gig or something recently? Uh, they had been on the road with him for yeah. quite a while. Yes. Right. And you just had, and what, by just chance, you had never come across meeting him until then? No, not at all. We just happened to be in Las Vegas performing at the same time. Final question before I let you go. Uh, that's a that's a cool story. You've uh, you've added to, uh, quite a bit of detail to the Elvis story. Um, Dion Warwick again talking with us during her Blue Note run of dates through Sunday. I as I said to you in the other day, it's a it's a career of partnerships. Yeah, not a lot of people. Everybody has a partnership of different kinds, but you've had many with so many different people as we were mentioning. Whether it's hosting a TV show with Glenn Campbell and CCR there with you and Bert, whether it's singing with Tina, whether it's working with Smokey Robinson I mean I could we could be here all night thinking about all the cats that you've gotten to work with there are probably some though that are really special to you maybe you don't have those people anymore or maybe that experience is one that helped shape your career you like to mention them because maybe you hope their spirit will know that you're you're paying tribute to them still what are the ones maybe just a couple of highlights in your eyes from your view not things that I may have suggested but that give you a lot of satisfaction to say yep I did do that with so and so yeah. No, it's the case of all my mentors. I was a truly blessed young lady. I had the pleasure of being around the icons of our industry. And those that I was around just embraced me. I became their baby. Uh, Lena Horne, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, Diane Carroll, Sammy Davis Jr., who I love and miss him so terribly, Frank Sinatra, who I endeared myself to and he endeared himself to me I call him Poppy and uh, we share the same birthday um, Dean Martin George Burns uh, Bob Hope I mean they all just embraced me and I became their baby it's a great tribute to a bunch of heavy cats. You answered it just like I could have wanted. I hope this wasn't a hassle. I hope you had a good time. I really appreciate getting to connect with the great Dion Warwick in person here through Sunday at the Blue Note. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. It's Dion Warwick. I'm back joining you for the Pledge Drive. And what the world needs now is a pledge from you. This is Hawaii Public Radio, and we're members supported. That means if you're listening, you really should be a member. You're tuned to All Things Considered, where you've heard me with my friend Dave Lawrence, so don't walk on by. Please make a pledge right now. <laughs> Whatever you can afford is greatly appreciated. Here's how to do it, and thanks for giving us a helping hand.